Greetings, comrades. In this episode, I will talk about the nationalism and the rights of self-determination. Now, what I'd like to make clear is that I'll talk about the normal, nice kind of nationalism, namely, the kind that makes you want to have your own country and not to be oppressed. The kind that makes you remember how proud you are sometimes for what your ancestors have done. Like, what, what makes you remember the best moments of your country. Not that other kind. Like, you know, maybe you don't know, but in modern-day Russia there are military clubs being formed in kindergartens, where five-year-olds choose to be in the either Navy, Border Guard, or Spetsnaz groups to <clears throat> help Putin defend against NATO. This is a real thing, by the way. I just imagine little Ivanushka being dressed up in a state-paid uniform and saluting Putin's image. That's amazing. But no, no, when I talk about nationalism, I'm talking about how Latvia and Estonia grew and really fought and shed a lot of blood to have their own country, to have our country, to have the place where I live in, to have the place where Estonians live in. It's, it's important to us. This is our story. I have decided to leave Lithuania out for now and pair them with Poland. Because even though culturally we Latvians are much closer with Lithuanians, from a political aspect and historically, we are much more tied to Estonians. You know, we were in Livonia, after all. And it's simply more logical to give Lithuani Lithuanians the honor to talk about their own political partners, the Poles. Also, this will allow me to talk more in detail about the motivations and the political aspects of the whole story. So yeah, next episode is going to be Lithuanians and the Poles. This episode is Latvians and Estonians. But before we go into this and start the story, I want you to think about how your country became, you know, a country. Or what was its defining moment when it became like it is now? What does it mean for you to be a citizen of your country? For us and Estonians, like that one period which you remember as the moment when we became who we are, is this one. Is this period. It's, it's like these independence struggles arising from the chaos and enduring the suppression actually finally managing to do what we wanted all along. It's much like the American Revolution is for the people in the States. So I wish you to look at this from the right mood and the right perspective and to understand from where I come in from when I tell this study to you. Because even though the study is dark and full of terrors, it has a pretty good ending, I think. Or, you know, so I hope. So with this in mind, let's go on with the show. The story begins around 1850s in the Estonian city of Dorpt. Or Tarbat, if you want to be Latvian. <laughs> that's modern-day Tartu. Dorpt is special because that's where the first university of the Baltic provinces, the Baltic governorships, or gubernias, was reopened in 1802. See, Baltic provinces in this case meaning Vidzeme, Kurzeme, and Estonia. See, that university in Estonia is the center of both Estonian and Latvian national awakening movements. It had originally been founded in 1632 by our Swedish overlord at the time, Gustavus Adolphus. But then, with all the Swedish and Russian wars, it got moved around and finally was closed in 1710 when the Russians took over. So in 1802, by the initiative of local German nobility, and with the order of Alexander I, it was reopened as <clears throat> Kaiserliche Universität zu Dorpat. You might ask, hey, why would the Russian Tsar open a university and give it a German name? Well, just to remind you, the German ruling class stuck around these parts since the Crusades, and only went away from our region right at the beginning of World War II. And they had a lot of autonomy and power. So, up until 1893, the official study language of this university was German. And up until the mid-19th century, people who studied there were almost exclusively German nobles. You see, although the Tsar's laws in 1819 had dictated that in the Baltic provinces, for every thousand souls in each district, there has to be a school for the peasant children where, quote, they could learn to read, learn to recite from memory, and learn to sing pious songs, End quote. It never really got going until 1840s. One of my most wonderful sources, a history book written in 1935 by one of our most favor most influential historians, a person who literally kind of 
was in the beginning and in, in, in the cradle of, of Latvian historiography. Uh, Alexander Greens, who was also a World War One and independence war, and our independence war veteran, and who was also a novelist and historian, just a great guy. <clears throat> now, this this history book states that uh, in 1836, in the province of Vidzeme, for example. There are only 33 parish schools and 14 estate or district schools, where in total only 850 children were getting their education. Obviously, the situation wasn't much better in Estonia or Kurzeme. See, this is because the previously mentioned German nobles couldn't care less about the status of the local population or our education. Well, obviously not all of them, but you can see the trend, uh, trend here. Previously, our local cultures were uh, something of an entertainment for those people. You see, in the 18th century, many of these private secret cabinet collections which later turned into museums started, and history and science and learning in general had become a fad for the nobles. So, while some local Germans gathered various artifacts, some started to take interest in Latvian and Estonian language, songs, culture, folk tales, and such. Now, of those, some were generally, generally well-meaning people, who genuinely cared about our people, while the vast majority, honestly, just really didn't care. See, one of these genuinely caring people was a Baltic German pastor, historian, and journalist, August Wilhelm Huppel. He collected Latvian and Estonian folk songs, he was the source material translator for the first newspaper in Estonian language, and wrote an Estonian grammar handbook. His largest work is <clears throat> Topographische Nachrichten von Lief und Esland, meaning Topographical News on Livland, which is today's Vidzeme, and Estonia. Uh, topographical here meaning on various topics, and not related to maps directly. It's a massive four-volume work written in the late 18th century about this area. But he also wrote for the Estonian newspapers, you know, working for one too, aiming to improve the status of the local populations. And in the early 19th century, the same year when Alexander reopened the university in Tartu, he wrote on the situation in the Baltic provinces. Now, a, a mild warning. I picked the following quote so that the people in the United States and in the Western world in general could relate it to, could, could relate to it better. But it contains a racial slur. Just, just a warning, okay? <clears throat> so, quote, both nations, Estonians and Latvians, are slaves and complete property of other people. The estate-owning master of the serfs, and even more so, his dumb and selfish overseer, treats them as things. Serfs and, th and their children are being sold or traded for other things. Horses, dogs, fancy pipes, etc. People here are worth less than niggers in American colonies. A young strong man is bought for 30 to 50 rubles. For someone who knows a trade, up to 100 rubles are given. Same price is asked for a whole family of peasants. A servant girl rarely is sold for over 10 rubles, and you can buy a kid for 4 rubles. If the head of a peasant family has multiple sons or daughters, the landlord takes a few away, according to his wishes, making them servants, giving or selling them away to others, or trading them as he pleases. And, uh, by the way, this serf trade was legally allowed by the Tsarist government, the central Tsarist government. It was taxed just like, you know, any other business. So, as you can see, the education laws of 1819 were ridiculously unpopular among the German nobles. And why, sh why should they be? Someone whom you're going to trade for a fancy pipe really needs no education. Now, this changed with the new laws of 1840 and the strict enforcement of those laws. Because by this point, serfdom was r becoming really unpopular and the Tsarist government decided that, you know, a free population might be more productive and, you know, produce more money in taxes in general. So, the amount of local schools and education po educated population grew rapidly. And if previously the lucky few natives from these provinces who had managed somehow to get a good education or had acquired wealth somehow usually adopted German ways and hid their nationality because they were ashamed of it, uh, they became the so-called <clears throat> Willow Germans uh, in a slang way, then, by now, a whole national awakening was starting. Those who finished Tartu University starting from the 1850 became the first generation of local national leaders and did a lot of work for their people. Now, I won't go into these people in detail here, I might talk about this period again in the future, 
we we do need to get to 1918, after all. But this is where it all begins. Also, I have to say, even though we were working together, it was two national awakenings, really. Like, even when our national founding fathers were mingling around the Tartu University starting from these 1850s, you see, we, we liked each other. But we never saw each other as the same people. Estonians did their own cultural stuff for their own people, and they were taking inspiration from us Latvians and the Finns. And we did our own stuff taking inspiration from, you know, Estonians and the Finns as well. Now, not to say that there weren't common parties and discussions in pubs about what to do and how to cooperate in certain things, but it wasn't like they were a single movement. No, 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 we have to talk about separate movements at this point, who cooperate sometimes, but they're separate. The ideas, however, were quite similar. Namely, the p- one point of cooperation, at least at the beginning, was <clears throat> was the fact that people were trying to reduce the power of local German nobility and their autonomy of the region. You see, at that time, people were blaming the local German nobles on the poor situation of our peoples. They had basically autonomous rule in these Baltic provinces, paying taxes to the Tsar, but otherwise acting much like they wanted. So these folks in the mid-19th century, these National Awakenist people, spent their time working with the Russians and the Tsar to ensure that the German noble rule would be broken here. They viewed the Tsarist government as their ally in this struggle. Basically what the people wanted was autonomy for the culture within the Russian Empire. There was no thought for independence just yet. Well, almost no thought. There were there were some very quiet conversations about, hey, maybe Latvians and Lithuanians should, should hang together, maybe we should do it with Estonians, maybe Estonians should do it with the Finns, but that was a very, very, very minor part of this movement, and, and it wasn't what the mainstream National Awakening was all about. And, uh, see, they, they were also abusing legal loopholes in all of the situation, because the local German ability was, was, re- was strictly against any, any such nationalistic movements and, and this, this awakening thing. Uh, the Tsar didn't care, so the Tsar was seen as an ally, but the locals had to abuse legal, legal loopholes. For example, in Riga, the graduates from Tartu, who, which was the center of everything, wanted to open a national society for Latvians, you know, just like these Jacobin clubs in the French Revolution. And even though, like I said, the Tsar couldn't really care about this situation, the local Germans resisted and prohibited such a society. So only in the late 1860s, when Estonia and Finland suffered from famine due to a few terrible harvests, the local government, local German government, allowed for, quote, concerned Latvians to gather resources to aid their starving brothers. And so we did. Thus, quote, Latvian Aid Society for the Help of Starving Estonians was founded. Obviously, they did actually help Estonians a bit, but at the same time, this served as the basis and the foundation for our, for our national movement. Uh, this was how, this was later renamed to a Latvian Biedrib or Latvian Society, and, and was, was kind of the, the nationalistic place which will become extremely important later in our independence fights. And similar similar societies were formed also in Estonia, and, and but they had to also abuse such loopholes. And you see, the problem was, we in Estonians got really, really, really good at these loophole things, these societies, this national movement, uh, it was, it was, it was just everything to us. We got, we managed to get education, we, we got way more educated, we got jobs and administration, we circumvented the Germans, and like I said, there were various societies which were formed, we, we had our national traditions restored, national sing and song and dance festivals, everything was happening. And, by the 1870s, things were actually looking better than ever for our peoples. See, Alexander II, the reformer and the Tsar that had abolished serfdom, was on the throne. Everything was looking quite peachy. And although the local German nobles were still there, efforts had succeeded and their influence was weakened, even though they still were the ruling political class, but the status of the people were a bit better, they lived more quality, the the, the quality of their lives had improved, they had their own traditions, but politically they were still ruled by the Germans. By the way, one great result of all of this situation, of this national awakening, by the way, was a massive rise in literacy. You see, Finland and the Baltics by the 1870s had a literacy rate over 95% among the native population, which was extremely high. Much higher than the Russian proper. I mean, over 95%. It was, uh, I guess, 97% in Finland, 96.1% in Estonia, and around 95.8% in, in Kurzem and Vidzem. 
see this was this was really really high at the time because in Russia proper there were there were no no such such interest among the nobility because there there even though you see Latvians had no nobles at this point so all the Latvians worked kind of um, as a single team and and the rich Latvians inspired and the Estonians inspired by this national spirit tried to help their own people while in Russia there was still this uh, strict class class split between nobles and the serfs and even though the nobles were educated extremely and extremely civilized they really couldn't care about their own their own peasant population down there so they didn't really inspire inspire the the russian the russian proper population to learn as much that that would come later mm. so uh, this this uh, this was this massive spike of interest in the, of the newspapers in the local language. This newly acquired learning possibilities and, and all of this awakening was going on. It really pushed for this. And this so-called call to education was actually one of the biggest things that our first wave of founders, both Estonian and Latvian, pushed for the most in our peoples. So yeah, by the 1870s, it wasn't all bad. That is, that is, until 1877. You see, at about the same time as we experienced our national awakening, something similar started to happen in Russia among the nobles. Because like I said, there is in Russia there is still, over here there are Latvians and Estonians and Germans, and Germans are the nobles and the political ruling class, and then Latvians and Estonians just, just see themselves as, as more or less, you know, equals. Because we don't have any Latvian nobles, there are Latvian educated people, Latvian wealthy people, but they can still relate. And same with Estonians. While in Russia, there is still this split, like I said before. So, in in uh, among the Russian nobles, a Slavophile faction, inspired by the works of Pushkin and Gogol and others, had gained major traction there. See, these people demanded that Russia should have one faith, the Orthodox faith, one culture, the Russian one, and that everyone should live under one absolute ruler, the Tsar, obviously. Now, as you can imagine, they also demanded the complete Russification of the rest of the peoples of Russia. They didn't like the autonomy that Finland and the Baltic provinces experienced at this point. Now, according to this movement, all lands under the Tsar should be ruled completely equally according to Russian law. So, even though Alexander II was sympathetic to the German nobles in the Baltics, but he was being hard-pressed by his Slavophile nobles. So, in 1877, the Baltic provinces, again, Vidze, Mikurzem, and Estonia, that were autonomous and politically in the hands of the German nobles were struck by a law that now declared that the all-Russian administrative law on provinces and cities would now apply to the Baltics as well. See, previously, the economies of the cities in this region as well as the police and courts were all in the hands of the respective city councils, called Rate. This Rate was not elected. Being on it was essentially being like on the Supreme Court of America. It was a lifelong term. And when someone retired from it or died, the rest of the council members picked a replacement by themselves as they saw fit. It would be like, you know, if if, the, if one of the Supreme Court rules, court judges in, in the United States, they retire, and instead of the Senate picking someone and, and confirming them, the rest of the judges just pick, pick someone and invite them in. So this was the first thing that changed. Now the city councils would be elected. The elected council would then choose a mayor and his ministers, his aides, and they, even though they would be the executive apparatus of the city, they still had to obey the elected city council. Now, obviously, suffrage was limited only to the wealthier classes, to landlords, merchants, and manufacturing owners, but it severely impacted the power base of the Baltic Germans. So they, being worried about their status and seeing our national movements gaining power and pushing them even further, like, out of importance, decided to put the blame on the so-called <clears throat> separatist and terrorist Latvians and Estonians, who apparently were, <clears throat> apparently, quote, were against the Tsar and were planning to incite riots. At the same time, the national movements, as mentioned before, saw the Russians as their natural allies, and try to use the Slavophile movement to weaken the German noble positions, trying to appeal to them to continue the administrative reforms and make this region even more like the rest of the Russia administratively, but they were trying to trade in their support against the German nobles for basically being allowed to keep their culture and traditions intact, and, and their idea, as I see it, was that even though we shall be ruled administratively just like the rest of Russia, we shall keep kind of our cultural autonomy, you know, strike a bargain with the Slavophiles. 
Because of this mess and this antagonism before the Estonians and the Germans and Latvians and the Germans, the new Tsar, Alexander III, who was very much influenced by the Slavophile faction, declared that a <clears throat> senatorial audit would be done in the Baltic provinces to figure out what really was going on here. The auditor was a senator and a Russian noble, Manasein. And the whole thing happened in 1882 to 1883. The locals expected a lot from this audit, thinking that this would surely eliminate the German political lordship in the region. Manasein reports a huge amount of complaint letters from the local population, both in cities and from the farmers that came in complaining about the German nobility. And obviously, all the nobles complained about the radical nationalists who were obviously up to no good. Again, this was possible because of the immensely high literacy rate for Russia in the Baltics. See, almost everyone, including the poor peasants, knew how to read and write and do basic math, which was surprising and very concerning to the Manasseh. So the result of this audit was terrible for everyone in the Baltics. He did report to the Tsar, the injustice committed by the Germans in the region, but his solution was to completely eliminate any autonomy the region had enjoyed for everyone. The Baltics had to become Russia in everything, starting with Russian language being the only language to be used in all schools, forbidding the use of national languages there, replacing German administration and bureaucracy with Russian one, replacing the German and local languages with Russian in courts, police documentation on the railroads, basically everywhere. At at one point, there were there were even laws uh, prohibiting uh, like our own language being written in Latin, but but that that uh, that would end. At 1904. So this obviously struck the nationalist movement hard. Even though the nationalists had wanted some part of all of this, they had really hoped that with with uh, working with the Russian administration, they could keep some of their rights. But now, now this had gone completely. And by the way, at this point, the locals had become wealthier. They had acquired some rights. Their status was safer. So all these ideas that were in there during the during the rise of of this nationalist awakening in Estonia and Latvia th- that was kind of you know mellowed out people were wealthier they lived better and and you know, so see see the the ideas that had brought all this up they were literally struck down decades of decades of national work were undone national ideas went on decline and became something of an outer shell a formality. Something that you would adhere to, but, you know, you wouldn't pay much attention to. But, there's always some rebellion going on in the universities and for the rebellious youth, obviously, in the Baltics. A new movement would then sneak in and take the place of National Awakening. And we're obviously talking about socialism. See, later, local Soviet leaders started to operate in this period. Nationalistic ideas were replaced by class warfare ones. Underground presses shifted to print Marxistic materials, which were openly antagonistic to any nationalism. As, you know, Communist Manifesto dictates that a worker has no fatherland, only his comrade workers. And in this period, uh, namely in 1891, some figures that will appear later in this story started their work. Namely, Peter Stuchka, a later leader of the Soviet Latvia, and Jans Pliekšans, also known as Rainis, who, albeit is a Latvian national poet and would later be celebrated, was a complete socialist at this period. In the Baltics, unlike in Russia proper, the socialist movement was more concentrated in the cities. This movement here didn't care about the farmer situation in the still mostly agrarian Baltic region. Eventually, some social democratic movements split off from this main group as there were people from the old awakening who, although supportive of some socialist ideas, still were nationally oriented. So it's not like the whole movement was monolithic. But the whole situation looked like it would blow up soon. As in, by making a region lose its autonomy and be more like Russia proper, the prosperity also began to decline. Because a lot of these people who were inspired by the nationalistic movement kind of stopped sending their kids to, to the pure, purely Russian schools. It was harder to finish these schools. Education became, became slightly worse. And with that, the economy followed. And then, and then in 1905, well, then you know what happened. The 1905 revolution happened. Please, please go and listen to that episode. Because I will have to skip over here if you want to do this in one episode. So, after the 1905 revolution, the situation became a bit better again. With the suppression of the socialist movements in the Baltics, national awakening ideas started to rise. 
Eventually, the autonomous status of the region was kind of restored. Massive Russification programs were loosened. For example, it was now allowed to open private schools where learning was allowed to happen in the local languages and some press freedoms were restored. The economy improved as a result. The industry of the Baltic region started to move from grain and linen agriculture to intensive cattle farming. Local agrarian societies were established, mutual aid funds which organized various courses and helped the farmers to purchase much needed brand new farm machinery were also there. At the same time, these new second wave national awakening ideas no longer were concerned with autonomy. The Russification programs and the events of 1905 had taught the Baltics that eventual liberation and independence would be necessary to ensure that our cultures would survive. Of course, for now, in the pre-World War I period, such thoughts were expressed only secretly in underground intellectual meetings, but the sentiment was spread through these mutual aid societies to ensure support in the countryside. The situation was brewing once again and it was especially acute and firstly openly stated in the articles written by those who were forced to emigrate as a result of the revolution of 1905. People like Konstantin Petz in Estonia, who who escaped to Switzerland, and Karl Sulmans in Latvia, who managed to escape to the United States of America and studied in Nebraska University, were especially active in their calls for independence in their countries. Articles written by them, although prohibited by the Tsarist press, nonetheless were popular and were spread around and read in their respective communities. Then, World War I happened. Due to the local sentiment against the normal German nobility that had ruled in these parts since the Baltic Crusades, the people chose to support the Russian war cause fully, fearing that, in the case of German victory, things would be far worse than under the Russians, whom they thought would eventually allow our region to split off in a peaceful way, seeing how the propaganda of the Allies presented itself with the anti-colonial sentiment. This feeling was bolstered when the Russian government, after the German forces occupied most of the Kurzeme region, allowed Latvians and Estonians to form their national battalions. These would later play a crucial role in both the Soviet Civil War and the Baltic independence fights. However, how these battalions were used in battle was terrible. They, commanded by Russian generals, were often tossed in the most brutal of meat grinders, for example, being forced to assault fortified positions without machine gun support near Riga in January 1917. The brutality of the war is still remembered here, with places in Latvia now still bearing changed new names that they got in these battles, like Machine Gun Hill or Island of Death and, and the like. See, after these battles, a massive resentment settled in the lines of the national battalions. As a Latvian poet Jan Smednis of the time writes in his poem Tetsila, or Grindstone, <clears throat> Velti mūsu lapnie pulki gaisa viņas saule sānās, tīraļ purva sniega laukos, nāves selas ejās rānās. That is, <clears throat> for not our brave squads fell in the shadow of the underworld, in the snow fields of tīraļu swamp, in the damp trenches of the island of death. And, at least in Latvian battalions, this hatred would serve as the reason why, after the Russian 1917 revolution, some of them turned to the Bolshevik side and fought for the Soviets, one of which later was even formed in the Lenin's personal first Red Guard unit. And now, now we're in for the fun, very complex part. You see, Karl Sulmanis had returned to Latvia in, 19, in 1913. Konstantin Petz had returned to Estonia in 1909, and then served a two-year sentence in prison until 1911. They were the leaders of their respective nationalistic movements, seeing the opportunities as the war wound down, and became the most important uh, politicians in Estonia and Latvia. So seeing this as those two gentlemen are vitally important to our story, let's take a look at them, and in turn, to our independence movements and our efforts through them. Hi, this is Alice. Thank you to all who listen to our show. Thank you for those who send us comments and reviews. We read it all, and we appreciate it all. A huge thank you to all our patrons on Patreon and those who donate on PayPal. Thank you so much. We live off of your benevolence, and you help us create the best that we can. Additionally, we have two special announcements to make. First, as you know, we're part of the Dark Myths Collective. We would like to promote our friends from Rumor Flies show. They've been on the show as well, you've probably heard of them, and we've visited theirs as well. And in this special month, they're the Dark Myths featured podcast. It's a show made by three awesome smart guys from New Orleans talking about the origins and scientific bases of various rumors. 
They share our kind of humor and our secret agent that lives in their studio closet tells us that they're perfectly harmless and will indeed be persuaded to help us with the world revolution easily. <clears throat> they're, they're great guys. Yes. Secondly, we want to invite you all to the 12th Hop Salu Horror and Fantasy Film Festival. The festival takes place from the 28th until the 30th of April 2017 in Tallinn, Estonia. So this probably concerns our European listeners, but you should really consider going. The thematic focus of the festival will study the development of creature effects with the screenings of the documentary Creature Designers, The Frankenstein Complex, directed by Gilles Penseau and Alexandre Ponset. We will be there. And its highlights include the Cannes Fipresi Prize and Fantastic Fest Best Director Award winner Raw, the Sundance premiering thriller Killing Ground, and critically acclaimed Spanish thriller The Invisible Guest. The festival will also screen three films that have pushed the boundaries with memorable creature designs. John Carpenter's The Thing, Ridley Scott's Alien, and its sequel, Aliens, directed by James Cameron. So if you're into that kind of stuff, think about visiting and check out their website, which will also be put in the show notes. Thank you for listening to my rambling. And now, back to the show. Constantine Petz of Estonia was born on the 23rd of February, or 11th February in the old style, 1874, near the town of Tahkuranna. According to the locals, at that time, he was born in a barn of a roadside farm, since his mother couldn't reach a doctor in time. He started his education in the Orthodox parish school of the town, and then later in Parnu, uh, Constantine attended the Russian-language Orthodox parish school. Later, he attended the Riga clerical seminar in 1887-1892, to but... After deciding not to become a priest, he left for the high school in Parno. From 1894 to 1898, he attended the Faculty of Law of, guess where, Tartu University, that he gra graduated as candidate of jurisprudence. After his graduation, Pats served in the Russian 96th Infantry Regiment of Omsk in Pskov, and was later promoted as an ensign. After rejecting an academic career in Tartu, he moved to Tallinn in 1900 to start a political career. In Tallinn, Konstantin started his career as an assistant at the advocacy of certain Jan Poska, but he really, really didn't like the job. In Tartu, Jan Tönnison had already founded his nationalist newspaper, Postimes, in 1891. Pitts was planning to find, found his own in Tallinn. The first inspiration came from writers Eduard Wilde and Anton ha Hansen Tamsar, who could not get a license from the Ministry of Internal Affairs because of their social democratic views. These were the socialists with the nationalist leaning. Instead, they used Petz as an unknown lawyer with an affiliation in the Orthodox Church. Petz was considered by the authorities to establish a newspaper that was loyal to the Empire and would unite all Orthodox Estonians. However, in reality, his newspaper had a radical political content. Obviously, again, the abuse of loopholes as mentioned earlier. The first issue of the Teatja, the Gazette, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry if I pronounce Estonian wrongly. I, I really don't speak Estonian. Uh, it came out on the thir 23rd of October, or old style 10th of October, 1901, starting a rivalry not only be between Postimes and Tetaya, but also between Jan Tönnison and Konstantin Petz for the leading national figures. Instead of the ideological and nationalist postimes, Tetaya emphasized the importance of economic activity, and this will also relate him to Karl Sulmanis later. Obviously, there was strong governmental censorship, which, which made perfect sense at the time, as the full freedom of the press was not restored yet. And then, through this newspaper, he began his political career. See, Pat's political goal was, firstly, was to take power in towns where Baltic Germans still controlled the municipal governments. Petz served as a municipal advisor in Tallinn from 1904, and together with Jan Poska, he organized an electoral bloc between Estonians and liberal Russians, which managed to win at the 1904 Tallinn municipal elections. 
Pats became a member of the city council, and in April 1905, he became the deputy mayor, chairing the city council. His active work as the town government left him with almost no time for his newspaper. So, a group of revolutionaries, led by Hans Pögelmann, had taken control of Tetaya's staff, and they started publishing anti-government articles and called people for a revolution. And when that happened, during the 1905, Pitts was already an activist on self-government reform, where he supported national autonomy in the Baltic governorates. In the provinces, that is. In the escalation of the revolution, his newspaper was closed, staff members arrested. Pitts found out about this in advance and managed to escape in Switzerland, only to find out there that he was condemned to death in the Russian Empire. One year later, in 1906, he moved to Helsinki in Finland, where he carried on writing and being a journalist. Most of his work was published anonymously in Estonia, like I said, in these communes. He he had also advised local municipalities and these clubs and these land reform questions on how all of this should be organized. In 1908, Petz moved to Ollila, which was located at a Russian border near St. Petersburg. There, again, he became one of the uh, editors for the uh, Estonian newspaper Peterburgi Tetaya, the St. Petersburg Gazette. And this is interesting because uh, Latvian, Latvians also had their own St. Petersburg Gazette. And this, this again shows the unity and the similarities between Latvians and Estonians in this period. Because we were all in these Baltic, Baltic provinces. The Lithuanians were mostly bundled together with, with the Polish and treated a bit separately. And though he still was in Finland, he was an editor of this newspaper. In Olela, he reunited with his family, whom he had, you know, departed from when he escaped to Switzerland. But yeah, his wife, his wife got terribly, terribly ill. And at the same time, after his, his wife got extremely ill, Pats found out that, you know, he no longer no longer was condemned after after this revolution to death. So he moved back to Estonia in 1909, where he faced some charges. Minor charges at this point, but he wasn't about to die. So from February 1910, he served time in Kresci prison in St. Petersburg, while, while his wife died of tuberculosis in Switzerland, where Pets had sent her for treatment. During his imprisonment, he didn't spend time idly. No, no, no. He was he studied foreign languages and wrote articles to be published in newspapers. He was released in 25th of March, 1911. The governor of the governorate of Estonia complained about Pet's activity in Estonia in 1905 and pleaded for the government not to let him return. And he was banned from living in the governorates of Estonia and Livonia, that is Vidzeme, for six years. However, he had these good connections with Jan Poska, even though they were like, like not extremely friendly, but his connections helped him return, return, where he again found a newspaper, Tallinna Tetaya, the Tallinn Gazette. From February 1916, Pat served as officer in Tallinn, in, in one of these, uh, one of these, you know, battalions, nationalist battalions. And in July 1917, he was elected as a chairman, of the Supreme Committee of Estonian Soldiers. You know, one of these committees which then uh, the Soviets tried to establish. Where he actively worked to form Estonian units in the Imperial Army. You know, like actively make sure that the Imperial Army had these Estonian units as a separate thing, which then later, of course, happened. During the war, he also organized the the cooperation between Estonians and the liberal Baltic German estate owners, which separated him from Carlos Ullmanis, as Carlos Ullmanis was much less friendly to the Baltic Germans at this point. By this point, on October 11th, from 21st, 1917, the Imperial Germans had occupied the West Estonian archipelago, which consists of the islands of uh, Sarema, Hiyuma, and Muhu, or uh, you might know them as Ösel, Dago, and Moon. Yeah, while while this occupation happened, <clears throat> when this when this happened and they advanced on Estonia, Petz was able to avoid the mobilization again. Since the control after the February Revolution was now in the hands of the Russian provisional government, Estonians were pursuing for an autonomy within the Russian Empire. 
In local debates on whether to form one or two autonomous governments in Estonia, Konstantin Petz, who supported just a one single autonomous government, took yet another victory from his rival Jan Tonnesson, who supported two autonomous governments. After Estonian mass protests in Petrograd, the provisional government formed the Autonomous Governorate of Estonia on 12th of April 1917, which would be 30th of March in the early time. At this point, at this point, after the February Revolution, there is an autonomous government in Estonia, and it's run by the Estonian Provincial Assembly, or Mapaev. Petz joined this, and he became one of the leading figures of the Estonian Country People's Union, he formed this new party here, because this is a fully autonomous thing, which then took 13 of the 55 seats. Both left and right-wing politicians gained an equal number of seats in this provincial assembly, which made it difficult to appoint a speaker for the assembly. Jan Tönnison of the centre-right nominated the candidacy of Konstantin Petz, who, however, lost with only one vote to the almost unknown at the time Artur Wallner. At first, Petz chose not to join any of the parliamentary groups, but eventually he joined the most right-wing democratic group. Because everything on the left was socialist, remember. Uh, when we talk right-wing, we mostly talk about supporters of the capitalists here. Petz replaced Jan Ramond as the chairman of the provincial government on the October 25, or the 12th October 1917. During the October Revolution, Bolsheviks took control over Estonia, and the provincial assembly was disbanded. After failing to give over official documents, Pat was arrested three times until he finally went underground. Since Bolshevik power in Estonia was relatively weak, as, you know, same as with the Ukraine, they weren't massively supported by the population, uh, the Council of Elders of the Mapaev, of which Pats was a member, declared on 28th of November which was old style, 15th November, 1917, that this assembly established after the February Revolution was the only legally elected authority in Estonia. Since even the Council of Elders was too big to work underground, the three-member Estonian Salvation Committee was formed on the 19th of February, 1918, and Konstantin Petz began, b became one of its members. While the Soviet Russian forces were evacuating and... Uh, and the Germans were advancing, this Salvation Committee wanted to use this interregnum, interregnum and general chaos that was going on, which I described in the previous uh, revolution episode, and then they declared the Estonia's in independence. So, this Estonian Salvation Committee, on 21st of February, uh, by, with the delegation led uh, by Pats, was sent to Hapsalu, and they were, and th this was chosen to be the site of the initial declaration. But they were first to head back to Tallinn, since German forces had o occupied and captured Hapsalu on the very same day. Attempts to reach Tartu before German occupation had also failed. When Soviet Russian forces had finally evacuated from Tallinn and German forces were advancing, the Salvation Committee issued the Estonian Declaration of Independence on the 21st of Feb February 1918. Uh, yes, the declaration had also been delivered to Parno, where, where it had been proclaimed on the 23rd of February. Instantly, because of all this work underground and this massive support for this, you know, provisional government which had formed here as autonomous government at first, but now fully independent government after this new, new, new thing going on and all this interregnum chaos, the Estonian provisional government was formed, and Konstantin Petz became the chairman of the Council of Ministers, the Minister of Internal Affairs, and the Minister of Commerce and Industry. The position of Minister of Commerce and Industry probably remained vacant in, in reality, really. On the 25th of February 1918, German forces captured Tallinn and arrested Konstantin Petz on the 16th of June 1918. He was sent to prison camps in Latvia, until he was finally placed in a camp in Grodno, Poland. He was only released at the end of the war in the 17th of November, 1918, which is a very important date. After the deputy chairman of the Council of Ministers, Juri Wilms, had mysteriously died in Finland, Jan Polska led the underground republic. After German surrender, Konstantin Petz's second cabinet of the provisional government took office on the 12th November, 1918, making Pats the Prime Minister of the Provisional Government and the Minister of Internal Affairs. 
After Pat's arrived to Tallinn and the Manapev had gathered again, Pat's third cabinet of the provisional government was formed on the 27th of November with Pat's as the prime minister of the provisional government and also the minister of war, leaving it up to him to organize national defense. Because this was very, very, very important by this point. But basically, in practice, a lot of the work here was well, was done by the higher officers of of this of this army. See, and the defense was needed because the Red Army had started to capture Narva, the eastern part of Estonia, in November 1918. But now let's move to Latvia and get to this war against the Bolsheviks. So, the Latvian counterpart of Pat's Karl Sulmanis was born on September the 4th, 1877, Berz, Latvia. Born in a prosperous farming family, Ulmanis studied agriculture at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich and at Leipzig University. He then worked in Latvia as a writer, lecturer, and manager in agricultural positions. Obviously, trying to organize these, uh, these movements later on. He was politically active during the 1905 revolution. He was briefly imprisoned in Pskov and subsequently fled Latvia to avoid incarceration by the Russian authorities. During this period of exile, Ullman studied at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, in the United States, earning a Bachelor of Science degree in Agriculture. After working briefly at that university as a lecturer, Ullman is moved to Houston, Texas, where he had purchased a dairy business. Ullman is returned to Latvia from the American exile in 1913 after being informed that it was now safe for political exiles to return due to the declaration of a general amnesty by Nicholas II. Oh yes, Nicky did something amazing. Now, this safety, however, was short-lived as World War I broke out one year later and Kurland Governorate was partially occupied by Germany in 1915. Later on, in the early 1917, after the heavy battles near Riga, which I mentioned earlier, Kurzme province as a whole, one of the two Latvian governorates, was completely in German hands. Because of this, after the February Revolution in Russia, unlike Estonia, where just one governorate was formed, Latvia didn't become instantly united. Instead, a Vidzeme People's Council was formed as an autonomous governorate of that region. And Karlis Ulmanis, due to having massive popular support, was elected the vice-governor. Still, already at the time, seeing how pets in Estonia had fought for unification, Ulmanis wanted to do the same in Latvia. He was very much against the left-leaning socialist movements and parties, however. So, during the early 1917, to counter the social democratic movement, he formed the Latvian Farmers' Union. During the summer, he moved, to the, whole, he moved the whole Vidzeme Council to Riga and de facto started working with this council on the unification of independent Latvia and working on its future laws, presuming authority and completely ignoring the fickle, unstable February regime in Russia. After the Germans occupied Riga in the 3rd of September 1917, Ulmanis with his Vidzeme Council, now united with similar activists and representatives from other Latvian regions, renaming it to a national council, escaped to Valka and a bit later to St. Petersburg, from where he published a public letter calling for Latvians to actively fight for their independence. This was especially important as in the Brest-Litovsk German-Soviet peace treaty, it was stipulated that Russia would forever denounce their claims on the non-Russian lands in the western regions, and would leave them in German hands. And the German plans for the region were not nice at all. The Baltic German minority tried to found the United Baltic Duchy. When citing the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk on March 3rd, 1918, Soviet Russia formally transferred Estonia to German military administration, its future status having to be, term to be determined later but we spoke about Estonia previously. On April the 12th, 1918, the German Balts assembled Landeswehr Sammlung at Riga, asking the forming of the United Duchy of Estland, Livland and Kurland to be incorporated to Imperial Germany in personal union with the Hohenzollern family, a request presented there by the Landesrat in Riga to the Emperor of Germany. Latgala region, the very eastern parts of modern-day Latvia, were stipulated to be left to Russians. Such a solution didn't appeal to neither Estonians nor Latvians. 
Allied victory basically saved the Baltics, stopping the German colonial plans here, which would involve the return and strengthening of the German nobility, massive colonization plans, and, of course, confiscation of land from the local landowners to support the planned influx of Germans. In total, the German Council planned to move about one and a half million people to Latvian territory, which, together with the existing German and Russian populations, would mean that there would be twice more Germans in these regions than Latvians. Estonia, of course, would suffer a similar fate, because obviously the local German nobles had informed the imperial government on the previous cultural awakening that they knew about all of this. Now, this was the chaos, and they had started working in this unified Baltic duchy, especially in this Kurland region, as, as there were, like, you know, massive chaos everywhere else. Now, after, after, after this, after this peace treaty, and after the capitulation of Germany in the war, using the chaos and disarmament and everything in between, acting extremely quickly to stop even the attempts of forming this united Baltic duchy even after the Germans had lost and everything, Karl Sulman is together with the now quickly, completely united Tautospadome, or People's Council, rushed back to Riga and proclaimed the independent Latvian Republic on the 18th of November 1918 in our brand new renamed National Theater of Latvia, which was previously been the German Theater of uh, of Latvia. Weirdly enough, due to diplomatic efforts of our first foreign minister, Siegfried Sandomirovic, who worked for this council, Great Britain had, strangely enough, given a de facto approval of the nation's existence a whole week before its proclamation of n- November 11th, 1918. As, by this time, there were still remnants of the German forces in Latvian territory, but in chaos, which was which were subordinate to the German imperial governor in the Baltic lands, August Winning, uh, they, they, they had to be dealt with. But, so, using the political impetus of the moment and the general chaos in these lands, and also the now-returned parts of the Latvian battalions, this Winning was forced to sign the Winning Nota, the admission of the existence of the Latvian temporary government in the 26th of November, which then led to the dissolution of the never really there on paper only United, United Baltic Duchy in the 28th of November. So far so good, right? Together with, with the Estonians, approximately, right? Well, uh, this is where the Soviets come in, again, with more pathos and great, greatly more strengthened. Because we left Estonia with Soviets occupying Narva. Let's speak about how the Soviets decided to ignore Brest-Litovsk Treaty completely and start a massive workers' revolution in Germany through Baltics. So, Soviets, with all the revolutionary spirit and with all the warlords and wars going on everywhere, like Ukraine and Poland and, well, literally everywhere, were really pushing it with their world revolution idea. So, they directly invaded Estonia in November 1918, forming the Commune of the Working People of Estonia, claiming the Bolshevik occupied parts of the Republic of Estonia. Latvian territory was attacked on December the 5th, leading to formation of the Latvian Socialist Republic in its occupied territory on 17th December 1918, with, obviously, the political, economic and military backing of our good buddy Lenin and his Bolshevik government in the Russian SFSR. The head of government was Peter Stuchka. Oh, yeah, I mentioned him before. Told you to remember. He is important because if in Estonia the communist commune was formed sporadically without a clear leader, then in Latvia's case, Stuchka, our good old socialist pal from 1905, had become a member of Lenin's inner circle, as he believed that the goals of global communism were more important than cultural identity. So, you know, he got to form his own private socialist republic here. Uh, Janis Pleikšans, also known as Poet Reines, which shall become la- very important later on the Latvian story in future, not in this episode though, well, he was Stuchka's cousin, and even though he also supported socialism and united government and united government with Russia at first, and this internationality thing, he later became mm, kind of much more patriotic and socially democratic. By the way, despite having... Uh, Having the initial support of many Latvians, especially those of the Latvian riflemen, who could turn to support the Reds due to their hatred of the Tsar, again, this was important, he lost this by breaking his promise to provide land to individuals, supporting collectivization, kolkhos, essentially good old serf communes back, and instigating massive Red Terror, which also happened in Estonia with many victims in the conquered parts. So how did the war actually go? 
Well, I won't go into massive military detail here, because I have figured out that my podcast is not one about uh, extreme detail on military front, it's more about the political me- means and ends and the philosophy of this. And But still, I will just have to mention Lithuania and Poland now. But, like I said in the intro, we shall go into greater detail about them in future episodes, as they partner together similarly as Latvia and Estonia does. See, so it's Russia, hoping to advance through the Baltic states in order to bring about a socialist revolution in Germany, attacked in November 1918 and conquered three quarters of Estonia's territory by the end of the year. In January, the Red Army seized the capitals of Latvia and Lithuania, advanced with the Vantariver in Latvia, and occupied northern and eastern Lithuania. The Estonians, who by this point had obtained weapons from the Allies and received naval support from the British and more volunteers from Finland, were able to stop the Bolshevik advance, launching a counteroffensive on January the 3rd, 1919, and they managed to evict the Red Army from their land. The Latvians and Lithuanians, however, We were forced to rely upon the Germans, who wished not only to drive the Bolsheviks out of the Baltic states, but also, even though this nota was signed, to establish their own hegemony in the area. They had they had nowhere to return, really. There were just army parts stationed here, still and uh, still not disformed. They were just still here. They therefore prevented the Latvian and Lithuanian governments from organizing regular armies. They did help Lithuanian volunteers hold the Soviet advance in February 1919 and subsequently provided some military assistance as the Lithuanians slowly pushed the Red Army back. In addition, the Poles, who were at at war with the Soviet Russia, entered Lithuania in March 1919 and seized Vilnius from the Bolsheviks in April. Now, we mentioned the Poles a bit back in the previous episode where we spoke about their actions in Ukraine, and yeah, this is where the contention comes in, because uh, the Bolsheviks invade, they, they grab Vilnius, the Poles drive them back before the Lithuanians, and they never returned it. Because at that time, Vilnius was 80% Polish. And this was one of their border issues and the points of contention. Because the Poles later argued that they didn't, didn't take away anything from the Lithuanians, oh no, 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 they recaptured it from the Soviets. <laughs> so, this was quite interesting at the time. Just to show you that uh, literally chaos everywhere. But you see, after this pushback from the very much disorganized Soviets, uh, the commander of the German troops in Latvia, General Rüdiger Graf von der Goltz, sought to transform Latvia into a base for a new anti-communist German-Russian force and to continue on with this idea of uh, forming Baltic regimes loyal to Imperial Germany and pre-revolutionary Russia. Because, you see, although the idea of the United Baltic Duchy was dead, uh, they really tried to form their own independent governments. They they went about, like, not forming the United Baltic Duchy, but hey, wait a minute, what if we could transform these nationalist governments into something who would basically be kind of like our puppet states? That would work as well, and would kind of, in this period of warlordship and tiny, tiny little countries and, and like, massive chaos all around Eastern Europe, they wanted to establish their own power bases, which would then later work with the Germans, and, you know, just, they would become warlords and rulers of their own right. Now, although von der Goltz's forces took Riga from the Red Army on May 22nd, 1919, They were stopped by the Estonian army and about 2,000 Latvian troops, because by this point, the Estonians had driven off Soviets completely from their territory, and the German army didn't enter Estonia by this point due to the naval support and massive support of the Allies stationed there and because of these Finnish troops there. The Germans were then compelled to abandon Riga, and this previously existing autonomous Latvian government was restored. Still, they hoped to dominate the Baltic region, and General von der Goltz, who had retreated into Kurland, joined forces in the July when the anti-communist West Russian army, another one of these white warlords, Colonel Pavel Bermont Avalov, who again came out of the Orthodox Seminary, was an alcoholic, a massive alcoholic, and a visionary, and claimed relationships, claimed descent from Catherine the Great. Yeah, this comes this comes crazy because by this point the white warlords want to claim descent from literally everyone. And at one point Bermontavalov also said that he had the real Anastasia with him. 
all these crazy things which happen here in this massive, massive chaos. So they unite their forces, as uh, previously von der Goltz with his volunteer Landeswehr were crushed. So they take these forces, combine them with Colonel Bermontavalo, and participated in his attacks, Bermontavalo's attacks, which was white army who came in from Russia, participated in his attacks on Riga and on northwestern Lithuania. By the way, I have to say that uh, in the fights in Lithuania, our own red riflemen also participated in them, which is a period of our history which we are not proud of. But again, this is next episode. Anyway, Bermond's campaign, however, was unsuccessful. He was beaten in the November 11th in 1919 in the battles near Riga. It is now called, this date is now called Lachplashedien, or Bear Slayer Day. In the name of our national hero, it's celebrated much like Veterans Day, where we go to memorials of these independence wars. And, you know, this is remembered as this was probably the greatest achievement of our military. And here's some explanations needed. You see, Bermond's forces at the time, even though he claimed he had 60,000 men, he really overestimated these numbers, but, but, Bermond's forces consisted of 15,000 men, 65 cannons, 24 airplanes, and two armored trains. Okay. Latvian forces at the time consisted of 11,000 men, with just 9 cannons, 20 machine guns, 3 armored trucks, and 2 planes. Also, three tons of courage and a belly full of patriotism and booze. And we won. And, to be honest, we have to give thanks to the British warships who arrived just in time to do some preliminary bombardment and, again, help from Estonians. But still, it was a small miracle. (laughs) The fact that by December 15, after all German troops had finally abandoned Latvia and Lithuania, that was a small miracle because after this battle in Riga, we pushed on to Jalgava and, and forced everyone out. So yeah, in these independence forces, we had to fight the Bolsheviks and the Germans and then the Whites together with Germans again. This is what happened. So we're quite quite proud of this. So, even though the Baltic forces had subdued the Germans, the Bolshevik threat still persisted. In August 1919, the Lithuanians expelled the Soviet army from northwestern Lithuania, and in November, December of 1919, the Estonians repulsed a fresh invasion of the Red Army, which again came in here, but they were pursuing an anti-Bolshevik Russian force into Estonia. This is just crazy, honestly. And we were aided by the Poles, we Latvians, and we drove off Bolsheviks from southeastern Latvia. See, all this time it's like Bolsheviks come in and everything goes out, and yeah... (laughs) I'm sorry, but I will not go into an hour-long detail on all of this situation, as that's not really important. The important is to convey the feeling of chaos, the feeling of, of the fact that this is a brand new government, at least here, like, the brand new government is formed in Estonia, Germans take over it, then they work underground, they they get it back, then they manage to scramble together forces from the World War One veterans, of whom some fight in the opposite side. Latvia is even, like, formed after in, in November after Germany cap- capitulates, and the direct like a week later after the proclamation of independence, massive war starts on. It's just such a massive chaos that we over here at the Baltics are really, really proud that we actually managed to become independent countries. So this is this is kind of the way why we, you know, take legitimacy from all of this. But yeah, later on in, uh, in 1920, in February 1920, uh, the Soviets signed the treaties of Tartu, in July 1920, Treaty of Moscow, and in Riga in August 1920, with uh, Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia respectively, thereby actually recognizing the independence of the Baltic states. Now, let's go to the treaties themselves. You see, the Estonian Treaty established the border between Estonia and Russia, affirmed the right of Estonian people to return to Estonia and Russian people to return to Russia, and required that Estonian movable property evacuated to Russia in World War I be returned to Estonia. Russia also agreed to absolve all debt from Tsarist times and to pay Estonia 15 million gold rubles, a proportional share from gold reserves of former Russian Empire. Additionally, Russia agreed to grant concessions to exploit 1 million hectares of Russian forest land and to build a railway line from the Estonian border to Moscow. In return, Estonia undertook to allow the Russian Socialist Republic to build a free port at Tallinn or some other harbor and to erect a power station on the Narva River. Now, 
Latvian treaty had similar stipulations, but I couldn't find it exactly. But essentially what I found out about this was that Latvian treaty had 23 articles and dealt with the sovereignty of the state of Latvia. The first article obviously stated that <clears throat> the state of war existing between the parties shall be ended as of the effective date of this peace treaty. Article 2 declared the independence and sovereignty of Latvia. And Article 3 set the borders of the state of Latvia while also creating deadlines by which foreign troops should leave. Articles 4 to 6 dealt with military affairs and war damage. Article 7 with provisions for the return of prisoners of war should they desire to return. Articles 8 through 9 concern citizenship, repatriation of refugees and property claims. Adults aged 18 or older were free to choose either Latvian or Russian citizenship. The default being that individuals were citizens of the state in which they resided at the time the treaty was signed. Articles 11 through 16 dealt with reparations Russia was to make to the Latvian state and its citizens. Articles 17 and 18 dealt with commercial, transit, postal and navigation agreements and Article 19 with diplomatic relations. Article 20 addressed nationality issues and Article 21 established a commission to handle issues of mutual interest. Articles 22 and 23 deal with treaty technicalities such as language ratification, but... But... We never got those reparations for the first part, and uh, the movable industry was still there in Russia, and during all of this massive chaos, no one really bothered to even return everything, so we were basically left on our own to rebuild our industry, seeing that the Soviet Union actually formed only in 1922 after its own massive civil war finally ended. So there were still contention and conflicts between Estonia and Russia and Latvia and Russia at the time. But that didn't mean that we ourselves didn't have conflicts. Oh, no, no, no. We argued with each other. And we argued quite seriously, honestly. Because... Because both Latvia and Estonia claimed the Ruhnu Island, or in Latvian, Ruonjusalem, which, you know, heavy diplomatic talks were about. You see, Latvian side only conceded this island in 1923 for a military alliance. Now, there were things they didn't concede. At the same time, there were massive arguments about the city of Valka and its regional surroundings, which would include quite a lot of Vizeme region. Like, Valka is in the very north of Latvia and on the very south of Estonia. It's a border town, which was essentially in the border between both of the regions. So, the, and the Estonians just demanded Valk and everything around it and wanted to take a large bite of Vizem, which we were not ready to concede. At the end, the treaty was signed such the Estonia acquired about a half, slightly more than a half, of Valka city. So yes, starting from the 1920. Uh, we have this city of Valka in Latvian, or Valga in Estonian, which is now one of these EU cities, which is literally in two countries. They they are basically merged together. It's like on the middle of the street, There's there, there used to be a border point right now in the Schengen zone, the movements have become easier, and obviously the both city councils work together, as it is literally a single city. So... That's a thing. Oh, and their, 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 like, uh, heraldry of this city is essentially, uh, an arm holding a sword coming out of the cloud. And in the Latvian side, the cloud is, like, right-sided, and on the left side, and on the Estonian side, the cloud is, 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 is the opposite, is the mirror of this. So yeah, we have Valka and Valg, the interesting border city of, of Latvia and Estonia. But yeah. This is a, an interesting fact that came out of all of this situation, but we argued heavily with the Estonians. At the same time, this was nothing in comparison with our disputes about the borders with the Lithuanians, especially since Latvian red riflemen, like, helped, like, with, uh, with Peter Stuch government were the Soviet forces who were invading northern Lithuania. So, I can understand this. And when it came to the sea borders, oh boy. But yeah, let's leave that to the next episode, which is going to focus on Lithuania and Poland, and we shall try to deal with this chaos around the Soviet civil war and how the Soviet state was formed and what happened in Lithuania and Poland next time. So, thank you for listening. Do svidaniya, And I hope you enjoyed the show. details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast, subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The eastern border salutes you. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org 
For more shows like this one, the darkness awaits.